Thank you, Bob. And uh, it's actually very nice to be in a situation where we're uh, enjoying lunch at the same time as, uh, as presenting. Um, so my, the first case, I'm just going to actually see if this advances. Uh, Am I doing the right thing here, Bob? I've got the mouse is working well. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm getting old. Okay, lovely. Here we so go. So am I. No, no. <laughs> so this is the study, and I've just made it sort of multicolor just to wake everyone up a little bit. Um, this is basically a, a very pleasant 65-year-old gentleman uh, who had a very typical presentation with fatigue, um, some uh, symptoms from his axial skeleton, uh, and he had presented, actually, I should say, before, prior to this, at the age of 61, uh, into the fall of 2010. And prior to that, his uh, six-month physical had been entirely benign. Uh, a very typical background case in terms of newly diagnosed myeloma in the context of uh, his, um, oops, I'm sorry, I don't know quite where this is, sort of moving on its own. Uh, I'm gonna go backwards a little bit, just to go, okay, fine, let me just stick with this. So basically he was considered to have IgG kappa myeloma, ISS stage two, Drury salmon stage three, and he had standard risk cytogenetics with 13P deletion only on fish. Um, he uh, was admitted at the time in the slide that I skipped through because the mouse is being bouncy. Um, he was actually had a borderline uh, hypercalcemia, so he was initially treated with hydration, um, some steroids and IV zolindronic acid. And actually, not to sort of over, overstate this, but he did in fact participate in the determination trial just as it was opening at our institution. And the bottom line here is that he actually did very well with it, and he tolerated uh, treatment quite well. He was assigned to RMB, so he did in fact have early transplant. He had, did have some treatment in emergent peripheral neuropathy with bortezomib, but again, this was mild. Uh, and of course, when he then moved on to lenalidomide maintenance, this was as a single agent. Interestingly, he had what we typically see with uh, lenalidomide in a number of patients, some mild fatigue, occasional myalgia. And interestingly, um, during the course of his treatment um, with lenalidomide, he did see some diarrhea that was manageable with various strategies, including um, cholesterol. In any event, we did actually reduce his lenalidomide dosing um, from 15 to 10 after one year. I think the slide will move. Hope it does. Yep, perfect. And this is the critical point. After two years of remission, in fact, the maintenance uh, was arguably a little shorter than we would have expected for transplantation, again, pointing to the importance of this randomized approach. Um, he actually did progress on lenalidomide maintenance with an M-protein increase, and his, his uh, relapse was moreover symptomatic. He actually, again, had worsening fatigue and worsening bone disease. Now, this was reflected by uh, anemia to explain his fatigue. Uh, also, moreover, his marrow was clearly, after achieving a CR, uh, clearly showed progression with 40% uh, plasma cytosis. And interestingly, and most ominously, actually, whilst his 13P deletion persisted, he acquired 17P deletion in 8% of the plasma cells analyzed. Um, and basically, at that point, he entered, actually, a, uh, another trial, salvage therapy with pom pom pomalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone, um, with bortezomib given subcutaneously. Uh, and pomalidomide dosed at four milligrams. He's in the actual phase two portion of this particular phase one, two trial. And we increased his omata back to every four weeks um, because radiology had confirmed bony progression. He achieved actually a very good partial response, um, but interestingly, and again, commensurate with what we see with 17P, um, he did in fact progress after a relatively short progression-free interval. Remember, his first one to his transplant was approximately two years despite lenalidomide maintenance and consolidation. Uh, and then, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, given uh, optimal therapy in the post-transplant setting, arguably, um, his PFI um, with um, uh, POMVELDEX was relatively short as well at eight months. Um, interestingly, he did have some persistent peripheral neuropathy, but again, it wasn't particularly marked and no other major complaints. Bone marrow aspiration um, confirmed an increased percentage of uh, PCs, persistence of P17P, uh, and now, of course, he also had another uh, genetic abnormality to five on chromosome one. Uh, interestingly, his radiology had remained stable. So the question for you is what would you do now? Um, this patient has the opportunity to uh, uh, participate on a trial that we have opened at our center, daratumumab monotherapy on study. Importantly, he has access to carfilzomib, lenalidomide and dexamethasone. We have a number of carfilzomib-based studies at our center, um, but in this particular setting, we felt that carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone might be an excellent choice. Um, one other choice, if there was, say, for example, any cardiac risk or some risk factor that might move us away from carfils, would you consider of adding cyclophosphamide, perhaps, 
bortezomib index recognizing that cyclophosphamide itself has a cardiac risk, so so-called POM, Cybor D. Would you perhaps adopt the Arkansas approach, which would be VDT PACE? Conversely, would you reach for bendamustine, bortezomib, and dexamethasone and consider adding thalidomide, recognizing that he has some mild neurotoxicity and he's been through lenalidomide and uh, pomalidomide? Or would you consider another protocol, uh, bortezomib, panabinostat, and dexamethasone? So those are the three choices that we have available for this. Now, I'm not saying that one is wrong and one is right, but it would be interesting to see what your best choice is, arguably, and we'll come back to that, I think, Bob, won't we, uh, at the end. So in the interests of time and just because I think we have about uh, 10 or 15 minutes per talk, don't we? Well, yeah, perfect. I'm going to move very quickly through this. This is all on your um, plates and your, on your uh, computers, so um, the slides are fully available. So I'm going to move through these fast, so I apologize for the speed of, 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 of the presentation, but just to cover a bit of ground. I think as we all recognize, myeloma is highly heterogeneous and not just one disease. And what's really interesting and the point of this slide is to drive at the issue um, that within a patient, not only do we recognize that there are differences between patients, but within patients, this whole entity of clonal heterogeneity and clonal tiding has become especially important. And no more important is it than in the relapsed refractory setting. And in that same context, obviously we recognize some important platforms of myeloma biology, which I'm going to touch on very quickly, but just to reinforce certain key constructs. This is a cartoon I particularly like from a lovely review that uh, Antonio and Ken published some years ago uh, in the New England Journal, but it serves to illustrate the context of the bone marrow microenvironment, not just the stromal cell, but very importantly, um, the issue of targeting bone uh, as well as the stroma in that context. I don't quite know why I'm going the wrong direction. Okay. This whole construct of clonal tiding is also important to share. We've come to recognize that there's an ebb and flow of this disease and that as patients become increasingly relapsed and refractory, the tempo of their illness may accelerate. So in the relapsed refractory setting, we would argue patients' disease is guilty until proven innocent. This sort of construct that in early disease you can watch and wait, and arguably with early biochemical relapse in first relapse you can watch and wait. I think in the relapsed refractory setting, there really is very little place for that. What we understand about clonal heterogeneity would tell us that we need to throw a big net around this disease very quickly in this setting. The good news is that we have strategies that we can adopt to pursue this. And this is from a review that uh, uh, it was uh, my uh, privilege to be a co-author of uh, with Saga, um, which he published very nicely, this whole idea with this particular cartoon, which illustrates the construct of how you put together your backbone of a proteasome inhibitor and an imid, and then can very rationally bring in other small molecules in an attempt to augment what you may have already exploited previously. This, of course, does not include the critical role of monoclonal antibodies, which we touched upon earlier. But I also want to make another point, which is that the integration of previous chemotherapeutics, or rather established chemotherapeutics, is tremendously important. And you'll hear about that in a minute um, from Bob and, 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 and his presentation about the idea of bringing back conventional cytotoxics into the platform that can be very important in salvaging patients. As we think about relapsing disease, a couple of quick points to make. Comorbidity matters, prior therapy matters, time from prior therapy matters, mode of drug administration and convenience for your patient obviously is a consideration, but very, very critically, risk profile is vital. And then there's the potential role of second autografting, recognizing in the patient that I just showed you, his PFI, despite optimal therapy, was only two years. So the role of a second autograft in him would be challenging. If he had a sibling donor and he was much younger, perhaps an allo transplant in the context uh, of a protocol would be reasonable. I just list here a little bit more detail on clinical considerations for relapsed refractory disease and then roll quickly into the NCCN guidelines, which I think are very important to show you here, and, and um, both Raphael and, uh, and Bob will touch on them in a bit more detail. But the bottom line here is to understand that you can revisit combinatorial strategies with your backbones, be they uh, well, they were proteasome inhibitor and imid based, uh, and they can therefore be a variety of different agents. Bortezomib in this patient has been used very rationally. Carfilzomib would be the next logical choice going forward, I would argue. Pomalidomide and lenalidomide have both been used. Could you bring back in another imid? An interesting question. Perhaps in this guy, I would argue that the integration of lenalidomide back um, would be reasonable. Um, two drugs versus three, we already heard a very nice discussion about that this morning before lunch. I would simply make the point that 
with this clonal heterogeneity, with our understanding of the disease, with the construct of clonal tiding, I personally believe that more is more in the relapsed refractory setting. You've got to throw your net around this disease quickly and bring it under control. Do we have randomized data to support that? We actually do. This is the Garda Ray trial published in the JCO a couple of years ago, where Laurent shows clearly in the consenting of a randomized uh, prospective trial that VTD outperformed TD um, in the patients in this particular study, who actually, interesting enough, were uh, often progressing on lenalidomide maintenance, for example. So you might argue, well, that's no surprise that VTD did better than TD. But nonetheless, the randomized data speak for itself, showing clinical benefit. The crash now behind combinatorial strategies is very strong. I'll just show you some representative data. Bob will touch on his, where he did some seminal work showing basically that when bortezomib was combined with anthracycline, clinical benefit was seen. With novel and novel drugs combined, this became obvious relatively early, and the synergy between bortezomib and lenalidomide was established, and then was really beautifully validated by Ruben's work with CRD in the relapse setting, and Andras Jakoboviak with his uh, work with CRD up front. When we think of dual refractory disease, a couple of points to make. The median event-free survival from this is awful, about five months. The median overall survival is equally awful at nine months. Now, this isn't data that is just sort of confined to the XUS. This is actually integral data uh, led by Shaji from all of us, actually, in the International Myeloma Working Group contributing to this database, showing that outcomes in the setting of IMID and proteasome inhibitor failure are, are dismal. So what do we do? Well. Very quickly, because again, you've heard a lot about this this morning, I would argue that there are various strategies with which to overcome this. I'm going to touch on some of these molecules, but one important area which I want to bring to your attention is that of histone deacetylase inhibition, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that in a moment. Very quickly, we've heard a lot of pomalidomide data. I do want to showcase some of the OO2 data. Um, it was our privilege to lead the OO2 study, which was a randomized phase two that led to the FDA approval of this drug in the accelerated setting, supported by the European work led by Hesse San Miguel in the OO3, or, or, um, um, the OO3 trial, the so-called Nimbus study. The important point to make is that there's a whole uh, array of studies with pomalidomide from across both the United States, led by Martha Lacey, for example, uh, Joe McHale, and then, of course, in Europe by Xavier Lulu and, and others in, 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 in the European uh, myeloma groups, confirming the validity of this approach of pomalidomide-based therapy. And pomalidomide-based combinations are very exciting. A couple of points to make. Pomalidomide combined with cyclophosphamide, it appears to be a very good dance partner. There's some very nice work by Toma Mark, who works with Rubin, combining it with the clarithromycin platform, which is, I think, int very interesting. Again, there's the bortezomib-based platform, which we've talked about. And then very excitingly, there's the carfilzomib-based platform, um, which Jatin and Bob have led uh, as well. And very interestingly, too, of course, there are future strategies looking at POM combined with antibodies and other small molecules, including various new exciting agents. In the context of proteasome inhibitors, what do we have? Uh, we have an array to build to your attention. We've talked a lot about carfilzomib and bortezomib. I just want to bring your attention to other next generation uh, proteasome inhibitors, including a new and interesting one, very challenging actually to use because it's so potent. It's a beta lactone, it's called mirizomib. And whilst all the proteasome inhibitors target beta 5, bortezomib obviously reversibly, carfilzomib irreversibly, mirizomib not only targets beta 5 irreversibly, but it also modulates beta 1 and beta 2 which makes it very interesting because, in fact, upregulation of beta-1 and beta-2 subunits in the proteasome appear to be pathways of resistance to both carfilzomib and bortezomib. So merizomib is a compound of interest. I'll move very quickly through carfilzomib because you've heard so nicely about it already from Ruben and others. Very exciting, promising, able in combination in particular. And I show this because this is, in fact, um, the platform for the Aspire trial. Um, showing the combination of CRD being so promising, and again, work by led by uh, um, Ruben. So in that same context, I do want to mention other proteasome inhibitors that we currently have under study, not least of which is exazomib. This is the first orally bioavailable prote proteasome inhibitor, MLN9708, as it used to be called. And when you combine it with lenalidomide, again, this validation of the concept of the combination, this is data we presented at ASH in December, remarkable responses in the upfront setting. And I would stress that in the relapse setting, this drug has also been very promising. And in fact, right now is going forward in various settings, primarily in the newly diagnosed setting and now also in the relapse setting um, as a part of a confirmation strategy for its use. 
So in this same context, um, the so-called tourmaline studies have been pursued, and we're very hopeful that uh, exazomib will become the first approved um, oral proteasome inhibitor. This is just some MRD data supporting how uh, powerful this is, certainly in the upfront setting. Now, we already heard about a prosomib. Uh, Saga mentioned it in his presentation. Um, this is a very interesting oral agent as well from the epoxy ketone family and does appear to be qualitatively different. It's not only very potent, but it does, in fact, seem to have quite challenging GI issues, which we're working hard to fix. But what I would say is that what I've seen so far of its activity resonating with what uh, um, uh, Saga said, uh, we've been very impressed that it's very active. Now, in the last few minutes, I want to touch very quickly on the HDAC platform. This platform, unfortunately, ran to somewhat disrepute, might argue, because of the disappointing results around Veronistat. I would argue that perhaps was premature. Um, certainly, we've been pleased with the performance of Veronistat when you manage its side effects. Having said that, Panabinostat has been the latest then, and beyond that, there are a number of exciting other molecules that we'll come to in a minute. Panorama 2 we published in blood last year, and this was a phase 2 study in relapsed refractory disease, 55 patients, and we saw a nice and encouraging response rate with a 35% response rate in patients who were bortezomib refractory, despite being re-challenged re with bortezomib, panobinostat, and dex. Very interestingly, in the group with adverse cytogenetics, recognizing that we think this drug works epigenetically, um, we saw a 43% response rate, recognizing the number is small. The really good news is that we'll be presenting as an oral presentation the results of Panorama 1 at ASCO in a few weeks, um, where clinical benefit has been shown. Obviously, I can't go into any more details, but it's been a very exciting trial in over 700 patients, and the data will be presented at the meeting. On the back of that has come a very exciting molecule called Reclinostat, or ACY1215. The idea here is that this molecule may be better tolerated than Veronistat and Panabinostat, and so therefore provide a more selective targeting of the HDAC6 pathway in particular, and so be that much better clinically. And these trials, primarily led by Nupa Rajay from Mass General, are ongoing, and a number of us are all involved, Saga, myself, and Bob, and we're very pleased with the performance of this drug so far. So I think some real excitement um, behind this drug, particularly in combination. In the interest of time, I'm not going to dwell on the antibodies other than to say they are obviously a game changers in the relapsed refractory setting, and bringing them forward into relapsed refractory studies has been vital. The final point I would make is that the more you know, the more there is to know. We're learning more and more about mechanisms of actions in myeloma therapy, and this is really just a huge plug for participation in clinical trials, because here you can see how we're beginning to better understand mechanisms of action of drugs. And as you can see here, which I think is particularly intriguing, is the dissection of the mechanism of action of imids, where we come to recognize this critical role not only of cerebron, but downstream of it, the Icarus family of proteins. And very importantly, perhaps an unexpected observation, that in fact the immunomodulators appear to have a significant effect on the proteasomal apparatus, which may in turn explain why there's such synergy between the platform of a proteasome inhibitor and an immunomodulator. So some really fascinating work that's ongoing. So I just want to conclude by stating that in the relapsed refractory setting, we've got many challenges, but the really good news is that we have a whole array of new opportunities that are emerging, and I've summarized them here. And I'll just close again by stating that obviously as we go forward, the critical platform for this has been the collaborative mechanisms of trials um, that we obviously are, are privileged to be part of. I'll, I'll close there. Thank you.